Just, uh, I've seen a couple of you scribing furiously, and that's great. Please uh, do whatever you want to uh, take notes. Be aware that I will help you with that any way that I can. So if you want a copy of the slides that you'll see, if that's useful, then please just email me. Uh, if you have a little flash drive here, uh, here, I can give them to you now, or you can email me and I will just send them to you. Uh, that's easy to do. Um, also, uh, I know that uh, Brother Rogan is putting together the audio-visual, the DVDs. I understand that it'll take two discs. It'll be about 40 New Zealand dollars, if that's useful. Um, but also, the, all the notes are available. It's already published as a book. And this book will have a lot more in it than I'm able to say in the six classes, because uh, there's just a, a lot more to say about the Book of Job. So I'll just pick out the highlights of the gems during these presentations. That is available from uh, Sister Jenny for 22 New Zealand dollars. And if for some reason Sister Jenny sells out or you can't uh, get a copy there, you can always go online and buy one, but uh, it'll probably be a bit more expensive. That uh, price of 28 New Zealand dollars is a guess. I think that's what it's going to come to if you because sh they'll ship over from the United States. So it'll be cheaper definitely to see uh, Sister Jenny to get a copy of the book. Or if you don't need a hard copy and you just like reading PDF files, you read on your computer or on a Kindle or something like that, you can actually go onto Google Books and download the whole book for free anyway. I'm not uh, trying to restrict this uh, information from anyone. So if you're, if you're comfortable with a soft copy, uh, then you can get that for free online. And finally, if you say, well, 330 pages is a bit of a bit of a hard task either way. I've written a very brief synopsis of all the findings, obviously without any of the justifying evidence, which is just a little 12-page file. Again, if you email me, I will happily send you that for free. So whatever, it, it, you know, whatever if you want to access the information in whatever medium is most convenient for you, uh, let me know and we can help you out or you can just carry on taking notes or listen and sort of sift uh, the wheat from the considerable chaff and uh, take home that small grain that's useful. Okay, that's so much on the notes. Let's uh, jump straight into the class. What I've got laid out in, in front of me and Rogan, who are doing this show, is... Um... Oh, hi. <laughs> I lost my wallet yesterday. I don't know. Um... <laughs> Here is a layout of the Book of Job. Okay, so it's a very, and, and this is why this slide probably gives you an idea of why so many people suppose that the book may even be a fiction, which I don't think is a fiction for one minute, but it's clearly extremely structured. So it has, uh, the, the green numbers are the chapter numbers, so the first three chapters are written in prose, and that's sometimes just called the prologue, and the last chapter, chapter 42, is also written in in, in prose, and that's often called the epilogue. And then in between, you have this extremely structured debate where th the three friends, whom we've already, uh, hopefully with some confidence, identified as the hosts of the Satan, are wrestling with the righteous man. So you have Eliphaz is the, is the elder, I think, of the three, and he speaks first, and then Job replies, and then Bild Bildad speaks in chapter 8, and Job replies, and Zophar speaks in chapter 11, and Job replies. And it goes through this very orderly sequence of presentations between all the speakers. They almost speak three times each. Uh, and just as, as actually Bildad, the second speaker, is speaking for the third time, you'll see this chapter is extremely short. I think there's some evidence that Job's actually cut him off. He will not hear any more. He's had enough. And so he speaks at length, and he gives two discrete speeches at this point, and then there's a bit of an impasse and a bit of tension and that's where Elihu enters and speaks, and then God speaks twice, he gives two separate speeches, and then you have the conclusion of the matter. So, without looking at the content per se, there is the structure of the book just at a glance. And uh, it's read, in, if you're following the reading planner, during the uh, month of December, of course, which month we're, we're still in, and we're, I guess we're coming to the end, so this advice comes a little bit late. But uh, I would advise you, if you're reading the book of Job, I would advise you not to follow the planner of reading one chapter at a time. I think it's too slow to pick up the material. I would advise you to read one square at a time or possibly even one row at a time, whatever's comfortable for you. I think you maintain a much better sense of the developing storyline uh, doing it that way. Okay? Okay, here's an interesting thing. This is a different way of laying out what's going on in the book of Job. And I'm not just... Uh, I'm not just trying to create things that look complicated for that sake. We're looking for spiritual value and spiritual lessons. You might 
suspect that this is just, you know, a physicist who's gone too long without drawing a nerdy graph and is trying to keep himself happy, but that's, that's hopefully not what's going on here. What I've got laid out, and here are the chapter numbers at the bottom, these are the words that Job speaks. So each bar, if it's taller, means he spoke a lot more words, okay? That's much as obvious. And, and what I'm trying to do is, is just see Job's speeches and see how they lay out. So here, in chapters 3 and 4, Job gives a general speech. He just announces his lament to the universe at large, really. And, and as the story progresses, later on in the, in the work, in chapters 27 through 31, he's going to give two more general speeches. In between that is the debate. And these blocks of words, again, there's only the words that Job speaks. I'm not counting the words that the friend speaks. And when I say I'm counting words, all I'm really doing is actually counting sentences. The reason I do that is just because then uh, the number of sentences in English and the number of sentences in Hebrew will probably be a little bit closer matched than having to count through all, you know, make it uh, true to the original language. <coughs> and, and if you count the number of words or sentences that Job says in the debate, there's obviously two different ways to organize that. You have a choice. You can either say, well, let's add up all the words that he said to Eliphaz in the three times he spoke to him. That's what's shown in blue. And then all the words that he spoke to Bildad and all the words that he spoke to Zophar. Or you could count them a different way. You could say, well, let's count all the words he said to the three friends in the first round of speeches. And then all the words that he spoke to the friends in the second round of speeches. And finally, all the words that he spoke to the friends in the third round of speeches. Okay? So there's two different ways to count that, either the blue or the purple way. And, and what we see is that there's actually quite a simplistic but sort of very ar arithmetic mathematical beauty in the presentation here. In fact, that's almost exactly 100 phrases in that block, and this one is twice the size and this one is half the size, and there's 100 phrases in that block as well, and to a greater or de lesser degree of accuracy, there's about 100 phrases in each of those blocks as well. So there really is quite a lot of commonalities and simplicity in this presentation. The account of, of Job's speeches and what Job says is clearly relayed with great beauty and very great care and diligence. This isn't just some random argument and conversation, at least not what's given to us in the Word of God. So we probably should approach it um, with reverence and respect, because God has obviously taken some care to present us with a, a very beautiful, a beautiful thing. The question is, okay, we see the beauty, we see the, the ratios. What spiritual value are we supposed to deduce from any of that? Well, let's clean it up a bit first. Let's get rid of all the sort of the peripheral stuff. Let's take away everything except the blocks themselves. And then let's, let's sort of gather them together so we can see what we're doing. Let's put the green ones down there, and the purple ones up there, and the blue ones up there. Okay, so we see what we've got. These are the words that he speaks to each of the three friends. These are the words Job speaks in each of the three rounds of speeches. And these are the three general speaks, speeches that Job makes to the universe at large. And the trends are pretty easy to spot. What I'm going to suggest to you, and the evidence is there, so you can deduce it for yourself, is that the blue ones are all much about the same size, the purple ones are clearly decreasing, and the green ones are clearly increasing. And in fact, the mathematical ratio is very simple. The word exponential gets thrown around more casually than it should, but this is actually a simple exponent. This is half of this, and this is half of this, and this is twice of this, and this is twice this. So they are actually both in simple and genuine uh, unstretched exponential forms. Okay, fine, so what? So those are the observations we've made. The amount spoken to each friend is about the same. There's an exponential decrease in the comments Job makes to his friends as time progresses. And there's an exponential increase in the comments Job makes to the universe at large as time progresses. Okay, we can agree on that. The question is, where are we going to go with that data? What, what interpretations are we going to place upon that? Would you suggest it's reasonable to say that essentially, in terms of comforting Job, one friend was as much use as another? Even though there is a distinction in their characteristics and in, their, in, in, in the type of person they are, when it comes to comforting Job, they, they were as, as good as each other, or as perhaps as sadly as poor as each other. Neither of them, Job couldn't seem to get, he didn't favor one friend over another in terms of trying to persuade anything of, uh, of anything. I think what these purple and green blocks really show is the pathos of Job's position. And, and you can understand why. As time goes by, let's just put the ratio up. At the beginning, Job is eight times more likely to talk to a friend and loved one than he is to talk to a stranger. That shouldn't be a surprise, right? If some disaster impacts your life, and I'm sure we've all been through personal disasters, the first person you're going to turn to, you're probably you know, eight times more likely 
to talk to a friend than you are to talk to the universe at large or to any stranger. But as time goes by and we get into the middle of the debate, why we find that now Job is only twice as likely to talk to a friend as he is to talk to a stranger. And by the end of the matter, since that has halved again and this has doubled again, Job is actually twice as likely to just shout out to the hedgerows as he is to trust any of his friends. What a desperately poor situation. And perhaps this alone, just this evidence, really illustrates what a terrible situation Job found himself in, not only in the trials themselves, but in the inadequacy of his friends to supply uh, any support. And maybe that's a guideline for us then, rather than to just say, here's a provocation for us to really beat on the three friends and call them rude names and say how useless they were. Maybe it's a guideline for us as a bit of an exhortation as to how to comfort others. <clears throat> Since the relationship was best at the beginning, when the friends were saying very little, I think it's a good idea to be present. In times of suffering, be present for your suffering friend. Listen. There may not be a whole lot you can say. And if there's not a whole lot you can say, then don't say a whole lot. The friends sat in silence with Job for seven days, as you know, when they first went to comfort him. And I have a, a vague feeling that, that the silence was the smartest thing they ever said. And <laughs> perhaps that could be true for us too. So remember, when you're, when you're with a friend who's in a great tragedy, your presence is probably going to be a great comfort. There probably won't be any words you can say that will make a great deal of difference because the thoughts that we can think up in terms of solutions will already be present in the mind of the one who is suffering. So I think that's lessons we can take, a very real lessons from the book of Job. Let's think about the time scale. How long did Job actually suffer? How long does the book of Job last? We don't actually know for sure, we can only speculate, but there's a certain number of clues and pieces of evidence that allows us to make hopefully an educated guess. We know for a fact that the three friends sat on the ground with Job for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. So there's a week right there in chapter 2, verse 13. We know that much, even though the entire book can be read in a matter of hours. We know there's a week passing in that verse. And then I've harvested a, a lot of information uh, from chapter 19. And again, you can, you can look through that or, or not as you choose, either on the screen or, or in the verses, mainly from verses 13 to 20. And I just want you to think, if these things had happened to you, how long or what time scale are they kind of indicative of? His kinsmen have gone away. His kinsmen are, of course, his family. So his family are kind of living in the house with him. Well, they've gone now. For some reason or other, they've had enough. They're not going to stick around anymore. His friends have forgotten him. So how long does it take before your friends forget you? His maidservants, those who work in his household, they count him as a stranger. They no longer consider him the master of the household. He's scorned when he appears in public. Now that's interesting because that, because that shows that Job appears in public. Now if you're desperately, desperately sick... You probably just batten down the hatches and take to bed and shut the world out. That's what I do. It's probably what you do. Now, if you're going out in public in a condition when you're desperately sick, it must have been going on for some considerable time before you realize, oh, this is actually a chronic condition that's going to be around for a while. I need to get back to some semblance of normality, even in my damaged condition. His intimate friends detest him. Hopefully that wouldn't happen overnight. They wouldn't be very valuable friends. Well, ideally it shouldn't happen at all. And he is nothing but skin and bones. Again, that's not something that's going to set in in a week. So with all those pieces of information taken from chapter 19, I think we're well to theorize that at the very least, the book of Job must have been conducted over a few months. I wonder if, since the people are gathered round for public debate, and they probably had a working life, I wonder if they gather each weekend or each Sabbath, and, and on each Sabbath, uh, you know, one of the speeches is heard for everyone to consider and they go away for a week. That's a total speculation. If that's true, the whole book of Job would last about six months. And I suggest that's possibly, you know, that's a realistic ballpark guess as to how long Job's experiences lasted. Now, without in any way minimizing Job's suffering, let's put this, let's not lose sight of the forest for the trees. Do we know how long Job lived, roughly? I'll take that as a no. 
We know at the end of this experience he lives a further 140 years, and when these experiences start, he's had 10 children. So we're going to say ballpark 200, right? Ballpark 200 years. Now, we also know that his life was extremely prosperous before these, this tragedy struck, and we also know that his, his life was extremely prosperous in all aspects after these tragedies struck. So realize that if Job lived 200 years and these experiences lasted about six months, actually the life of Job, despite this book, was probably an extremely pleasant one overall. You know, if someone comes to me and says, oh, I feel like I'm living the life of Job right now, I say, oh, well, good for you. <laughs> That's lovely. And for some reason, they look shocked and alarmed. But the truth of the matter is, 99.5% of Job's life was, was extremely well blessed. Now, again, I'm not trying to minimize the, the depth and tragedy of his suffering, but we should probably bear that in mind just to realize that, you know, for all we are trying to almost answer for why God has subjected him to such hardships, that is only probably 0.5% of his life uh, of which he was subject to hardship. Okay? So just, just bear that in mind in the background. Time and place. I think it's going to be important for spiritual reasons, again, to note the time and place of the setting of the book of Job. And if you look through the available literature, you'll find, again, a wide range of answers suggested. From the earliest time before the flood to the latest time, which is almost uh, at the time of Solomon or something like that. I want to be quite clear on when I think that the, the, the time of Job is, and I want to show you biblical evidence, not just made up theories of my own, for why that should be. The earliest suggestion, as I say, um, of placing, <coughs> placing Job is before the flood. Why is that? Uh, the arguments presented are because of Job's life length to some extent, that he lived about 200 years, and also some rather lazy exposition to say, well, the big, the big beasts clomping around in chapter 40 might well have been dinosaurs, let's say they were before the flood, and there you go. So that's kind of all, all the evidence there is. But there are quite a few expositors that, that go that way, not just the Delphine expositors in the main. Let's be clear that Job was not before the flood. We can be mathematically clear about that. Here's the verse that, that knocks that on the head. After all these things, Job lived 140 years, and in that 140 years he saw the fourth generation of his children. That's proof right there. Why? Because Genesis chapter 5 gives a big genealogy that seems to have no use about who was born and how long they lived and how long till they had children. And from the, the data in Genesis chapter 5, it's very easy to calculate that if you want to see your fourth generation, you have to live on average 410 years to see that. Job saw his fourth generation after 140 years. So, boom, that's out. And if you take the genealogy given in Genesis chapter 10, which, is, of course, is after the flood, the flood being sort of chapters 7, 8, and 9, you can see there's another genealogy given. You can see human life length, life length has changed dramatically, and your average to see four generations is 125 years. Therefore, if Job lived 140 years, saw his fourth generation, and by implication not the fifth, that is absolutely perfect with the idea that it was outside, it was after the flood and not before. So that's a, just a very simple, almost arithmetic argument, but I think it's quite conclusive. Job is after the flood. So if you're reading an expositor that says he's before the flood, yeah, he's not done, so, done good work there. So let's move on and find uh, where we might think the, the book of Job is placed. The most common uh, chronological placement you'll find in all the expositions that are written for the book of Job is at the time of the patriarchs, the patriarch being a sort of collective noun for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And I think this chart will show us why. I think that answer is also wrong, but that is the most common one you will find, and it's the most common one that Christadelphian expositors tend to adopt. There's some good reason why. Let's look at this family tree, and we can see why that is. There's Abraham, shown with two wives, Sarah and Keturah. Sarah bore Isaac, and Keturah bore Shua. And Abraham's brother, his older brother Nahor, uh, who bore the two sons, Uz and Buzz. Why is that useful? Because in all of these lines, you can basically find the names that are showing up in the book of Job. There is Eliphaz the Temanite. This is the only Teman in the entire scriptural record. And we're told that he became a great tribe and a great family. And by the time Teman was born, Eliphaz was also a family name. So the idea that there should be Eliphaz the Temanite 
makes good sense here. We have Bildad the Shuite, and sh this is the only biblical character, uh, 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 the man called Shua. And we have Zophar the Naamathite, this is one of only two Naamans, which is at the same chronology. And we have Elihu the Buzzite, that rather confusing character who's going to come along a little bit later. Uh, and there's uh, Buzz is um, the son of Nahor. Let's not ignore the other son of Nahor either, because of course the very opening verse of the whole book of Job will say, in the land of Uz there lived a man whose name was Job. And there is one of actually quite a few, of at least three um, biblical Uz characters. So, if we want to find the characters that, or the names, the family names that are associated in the book of Job, clearly this is a great place to locate them. And I think this is accurately located. And so what happens then is the expositor says, well, therefore, Job must have been right about this time. That's probably making a little bit of a mistake, even though the names have been accurately located, because, of course, each of these people needs to become a massive tribe and family name, right? No one's going to be called a Temanite while Teman's just one man rolling around. He needs to become a tribe in his own right, which is going to take very many generations uh, before there is a Temanite tribe. So that's one reason why we still need to be chronologically significantly downstream even from Abraham, and there's a far better reason coming up in a minute. But before we do that, don't get lost in times and dates, we want to be watching for spiritual lessons. And there's a massive spiritual lesson staring at us right there, which I think is very important. Because yesterday we worked with Eliphaz and Zophar and Bildad, didn't we? And we identified them. And what did we identify them as? The hosts of the Satan. So what have we learned? Satan is a child of Abraham, for sure. And that's, that's a, a, a global truth. It's a truth that's very much expanded on when Jesus... Um, reasons with the Pharisees back in the New Testament, but it's not a new idea. Godliness is about behavior, not bloodline. Well might John the Baptist have said, think not to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, because even the very Satan of the book of Job could accurately and correctly claim, we have Abraham as our father, whereas by contrast, Elihu the Buzzite could make no such claim, and possibly neither could Job. It does not say that Job is an Uzite. In fact, that's interesting, isn't it? Do you notice that Job's genealogy is deliberately obscured? If you look at any of those three friends, you cannot find their name in the book of Job without their, their genealogy tacked on. It's Eliphaz the Temanite every time. Never is that abbreviated to Eliphaz. His genealogy is pushed in front of your eyes every single time. And Job... Job the, no, never, Job. Never is his genealogy given to us. Never once. And never once are the friends listed without theirs. So this, you know, that's so, so stark a contrast. I think it's, it's fair to say that's deliberate. Job's ge genealogy is being deliberately obscured from us. And for reasons that I'm going to suggest is a very good reason why. We'll look at that in a couple of days. But since he lives in the land of ours, it's quite possible, we don't know, that he actually comes from the Uz family, which means he's a Gentile. If you, if you want to define Jew, a rather loose term, as the children of Abraham, then you actually have a righteous Gentile being castigated by satanic children of Abraham. What a setup for the New Testament. Truly, things don't really change, do they? And yet again, we're not here to criticize other people. We're here to examine ourselves. Are we ever guilty of that? It's amusing. Occasionally I will hear someone come up and say, oh, I'm a, I'm a sixth-generation Christadelphian. Oh, very good. Satan also was a child of Abraham. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> don't, don't get too excited. Okay? It's not about bloodline. It's not about how we can trace our family for either good or ill. Uh, if we are going to have any reflection of our God, that has to be in the lifestyle that we choose and enact. So there already is a big... A spiritual lesson that's coming out even of that family line. But let's be clear about placing Job chronologically, and this is to me the clinching argument, and I hope it will be for you too. Job references the Exodus. Job talks about the destruction of the Egyptian hosts in the Red Sea. Now that's a bit of a giveaway that he's got to be chronologically downstream from there. Okay? And you might think, well, if that's true, 
if Job references the Exodus, why doesn't every single expositor, simply, and presumably they've read the book, why don't they just say, well, he referenced the Exodus, why would they put him anywhere else? Answer, because Job's reference to the Exodus is so incredibly obscure, it doesn't sound like one at all. Here it is. By his power, by God's power, he churned up the sea. By his wisdom, he cut Rahab to pieces. By his breath, the skies became fair. His hand pierced the gliding serpent. That's chapter 26, verses 12 and 13. And none of you are actually leaping out of your chairs going, oh, of course, it's a reference to the Exodus. That is. And I can perhaps understand why. It doesn't look like a reference to the Exodus. In fact, it doesn't look like a reference to anything at all. It just looks like an obscure piece of poetry we can't hope to understand. But... By going to the prophecy of Isaiah, and only if you've read Job alongside Isaiah, Isaiah is going to translate that, I suggest to you, unambiguously, and leave no room for doubt in your mind or mine that that is a reference to the destruction of Pharaoh's hosts in the Red Sea. What, in what follows, I'm going to be using the New International Version. It doesn't matter. This will be true in any version, but it's a little bit easier in the New International Version because this Hebrew word Rahab will stay transliterated, i.e. left as a name, Rahab. Whereas if you're reading another version, you might have an actual meaning of that word given. Um, yeah, let's look, at, uh, let's look at those references. First of all, Isaiah is going to tell us who Rahab is. Now, oh yes, let's, this is the one, one thing I wanted to say. This word Rahab occurs only three times in the Bible. And I've probably already accidentally misled you into thinking about the woman from Jericho. Her name is different. I don't know why in the English translations it comes out spelt exactly the same in English. That's not helpful. Her Hebrew name, I, I would like to see almost a C in the middle of her Hebrew name. It's Rechab. R-A-C-H-A-B seems a bit better. Not that I'm a Hebrew expert at all. But suffice to say, her name is different. So don't be thinking about that faithful woman from Jericho. She has a completely different name. Okay? The, the actual Rahab, R-A-H-A-B in English equivalent, this, this word occurs only three times in the Bible. Once in the book of Job, twice in the prophecy of Isaiah, and Isaiah is going to help us out. He helps us out right here in, in chapter 30 by telling us exactly who Rahab is. That unprofitable nation, says God, Egypt, whose help is utterly useless, therefore I call her Rahab the do-nothing. Again, if you have a different translation, it might say a couple of different things, but the Hebrew is unequivocal. That is Rahab. And you say, okay, fine. So Rahab is Egypt. That's okay. But that still doesn't prove that Job is talking about the Red Sea crossing. Uh, Isaiah 51 will make that uh, beyond doubt. Again, speaking about God, was it not you, God, who cut Rahab to pieces, who pierced that monster through? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made a road in the depths of the sea so that the redeemed might cross over? Okay. So that, I suggest to you, I don't think anyone would doubt, that is a reference to the Red Sea crossing of the Israelites uh, at the time when the Egypt was destroyed. And we already know that this is a reference to Egypt because Isaiah tells us so. So now I want you to consider this language in the light of what Job says, let me superimpose his quote here. So Job is saying, by his power he churned up the sea, by his wisdom he cut Rahab to pieces. Cut Rahab to pieces. Exactly the same phrase. By his breath the skies became fair, after the wind went away. His hand pierced the gliding serpent, who pierced that monster through. So I think you can see without a shadow of a doubt that what Job is saying there in chapter 26 is a perfect match with what Isaiah is saying in chapter 51. And thanks to Isaiah 30, it is unequivocal that that Rahab, the monster that is pierced in the sea, is actually Egypt. So that allows us to say, yes, this is clearly a reference. Job has heard of the Israelites coming out of Egypt uh, and through the Red Sea. And so for that reason... Job's chronology must be downstream from the Red Sea crossing. <clears throat> now, how far downstream can it go? You know, can we put Job all the way into the 1950s or something? No, we can't. Um, I don't have a limit on how far downstream we can go. Suffice to say that the tribal names that have arisen from Abraham's family of Teman and Shua and Naaman, they can't 
you know, we can't go too far before those names start becoming lost in history. And furthermore, Job's great age, even though it was given as a blessing from God of 200, we can't go too far down history before that becomes too obscure. So I place um, Job shortly after the, uh, the crossing of the Red Sea. In fact, therefore, at the time when, when uh, uh, um, Israel are wandering in the wilderness. This also makes sense with the location of Uz. Location of Uz is not generally disputed in the mountains of Edom, and that is to the southeast of the Promised Land. Here is the Promised Land. You can see the Dead Sea, and the, if, you, if you've got good eyes, you can probably see the Sea of Galilee a little bit high up. And so there's Uz, and it makes sense, therefore, why would three children of Abraham ever find, you know, ever come into contact with the land of Uz? Well, they would during the Exodus, because they've been down south at Sinai, and they're coming up through Uz, and then they're going to go up to the border of the Promised Land, and then they're going to fail in faith, and God's going to say, that's it. Your generation must die out. Go back to the wilderness and wander up and down and to and fro in the earth until everyone over the age of 20 is dead. And that would send them right back to uh, regions including the land of Uz. And then later they will enter the land uh, crossing the Jordan through Joshua. So Israel are prior to the entry of the promised land. They are wandering in the wilderness. And that makes very good sense, therefore, when God reveals to us what are the Satan? Satan, where have you come from? What are you doing? I'm just wandering up and down and to and fro in the earth. Makes very good sense if it's during the time of the wilderness wandering. Good sense for geographical reasons, even better sense for, for spiritual reasons. We're homeless. We've got nothing to do. We're just going to wander around until we die. You can see that Israel are at a time of a very spiritual low. So it explains why three children of Abraham, who'd be amongst the traveling hordes, uh, would meet a Gentile who is living and located in us. I'm not suggesting that Job is part of the, of the multitude. Job is a resident of us. Clearly, he's a powerful man, has house and lands. He is a resident of us. And it's the three friends who are traveling with the, uh, with the multitude of Israel who encounter him at this time in us if they come out of the Exodus. Okay, so hopefully that's, uh, that's fairly, fairly good. Israel are homeless at the time of Job. In fact, Let's expand this even further and look at the big picture. And this again is for spiritual reasons, not just for reasons of playing with geography. And we're going to consider the events from the books of Genesis all the way down to Joshua. I'm going to color code them this way. So Genesis activity is shown in pink. And all I'm going to say is there was a time when Jacob, Israel, literally Israel was in the house of God. There's a place called the house of God. Beth El is how it's written in, in Hebrew. And he left. Israel left the house of God. Right, so let's, let's take that on the spiritual plane. Israel walked out of the house of God in Genesis 35 and went down into Egypt. And that's the relevant part of the very big picture thinking here in Genesis. Throughout the book of Exodus, I'll show that in light blue here. After a considerable time in Egypt, and this fits very well, I think Brother Mori will be happy to fit his, his seven-point uh, template here over what's happening in this big picture story. After a time of trial and eventually crying out for God's help, God releases them from Egypt and they travel across the desert and they cross the Red Sea and they come down to Sinai and receive the law and they head upwards towards the promised land. And finally, and that uh, includes the books of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, of course, and then under the heading of the man called Jesus, or Joshua if you prefer, they are led across the Jordan into the promised land. And in Joshua chapter 8, as they cross the Jordan, you'll notice the place that they come to is none other than Beth El, the house of God. Now they have come back into the house of God. So it's a closed loop from Jacob in Genesis 35, who departs the house of God, from Joshua in Joshua, Joshua chapter 8, who re-enters the house of God. The closed loop takes approximately 500 years, so that's a, you know, an extremely long time. I live in the United States, so it's easy to present it to those audiences. That's about twice as long as the United States has been in existence. Very long period of time. So a real big picture thinking here. And, and that's the picture that we see. And that allows us to place the book of Job spiritually as well as geographically. Israel are at their lowest point. They've been outside of the house of God for nearly 500 years. They are wandering and lost in the wilderness. And it's in this embittered and, and downtrodden condition that they encounter the man Job in the book of O's. So the Job theme, the children of God are lost, tempted and wandering in the desert, 
outside of God's house. I think that allows us to really appreciate the, the spirit of the three friends. I'm not trying to castigate them and make them bad guys. I'm saying they are really uh, at a spiritual low point. So maybe we shouldn't expect, not that they're guilt-free, but we shouldn't expect them to provide great uh, spiritual examples and leadership and encouragement to Job because they themselves are in a terrible situation where they're just, they've just been rejected from the promised land by their God because they themselves rejected God in faith to take it at the first conquest. So that's the time and place of the book of Job. And I think it's useful to know that as you open those pages and start reading the words itself. Let's meet the three friends in a little bit of detail. Remember, Eliphaz is a child of Abraham, but he's also a child of Esau, so he's an Edomite. He does not go through the, land of, the line of Isaac and Jacob. He's, uh, Eliphaz and Teman are from the, land, uh, from the line of Edom. And what do we know about Edom at this time? Edom are the ones who would give no comfort to the children of God. The children of God said, as they're wandering through the wilderness the first time, this is what your brother Israel says. You know about all the hardships that have come upon us. This could be Job speaking. It's not, of course. This is the people under Moses. Please let us pass through your country. And the children of Edom reply, you may not pass through here. If you try, we will march out and attack you with the sword. Now, I'm not trying to visit the sins of the fathers unto the children, but at the same time, this is going to form a very interesting template for how much sympathy Eliphaz, the Edomite, the Temanite, has for the child of God, who is Job, not by bloodline, but by conduct. Think how you have instructed many, Eliphaz begins. These are, these are strengthening words. How you have strengthened feeble hands. Your words, Job, have supported those who stumbled. You have strengthened faltering knees. But as time goes by, and that embittered pride bubbles up to the surface, Eliphaz will come to explicitly contradict those words. Look, compare these two speeches, his first speech with his own third speech. Now he says, much later on, you demanded security from your brothers for no reason. You stripped men of their clothing, leaving them naked. You gave no water to the weary, and you withheld food from the hungry. And you sent widows away empty-handed and broke the strength of the fatherless. And he finishes with a flourish of the doctrine of retribution and says, that is why snares are all around you, why sudden peril terrifies you. So you can see Eliphaz, he might try and be sympathetic, but it's not in his nature. His true nature comes out as time passes, and he wants only to condemn Job because he was uh, jealous of his wealth. Bildad, arguably, is worse. Again, it is not our job to, to castigate brethren who will be in the kingdom of God, but we are not shown uh, Bildad in a good setting. He is actually a little bit vicious, because what he does in his second speech in chapter 18, and I've got three quotes here, is he talks about a hypothetical wicked man. This is Job. Let me tell you what would happen if I ever met a wicked man. Let me tell you what would happen. And then he picks things, you can read them for yourself, he picks things that explicitly match Job's condition. You know, he may as well have named his hair and eye color. You know, a wicked man would have you know, blue eyes and walk with a limp. You know, he may as well have just deliberately described Job. Fire resides in his tent, says Bildad, as if that comes from wisdom he knew. He did at least know that the fire of God fell from the sky, whether a volcano or a meteor or whatever, and burned up Job's sheep and servants. Bildad says, oh, you know about the wicked man. The wicked man has parts of his skin eaten away, as if this is a piece of common sense that we all know. But he did at least know that painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head afflicted his friend Job. And Bildad finishes with perhaps the most uh, devastating comment of all. The wicked man has no offspring or descendants among his people. And he knows full well that Job has had all of his children taken from him by disaster. And just in case Job could possibly have missed the point, surely such is the dwelling of an evil man, says Bildad, such is the place of one who knows not God. That is the comfort that is available from Bildad. So he's probably the most aggressive and acerbic of the three. Eliphaz is the oldest. Bildad is the most, uh, well, dare I say it, the most vicious, realistically. And then we meet Zophar, who perhaps is not as vicious as as Bildad, but he's a little bit pompous and perhaps uh, not so clever. Surely God recognizes deceitful men, says Zophar, and when he sees evil, does he not take note? And again, here comes the most clear uh, 
uh, essence of the doctrine of retribution. If you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent, you will lie down with no one to make you afraid and many will court your favor. The moment you stop sinning, the sunshine will come out and your life will become beautiful and rosy, says Zophar. That is what he seems to believe. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? This is kind of the New Testament equivalent of Zophar, who is, in fact, the purest by bloodline. He's a child of Abraham and also a child of Jacob, uh, of the tribe of Benjamin. So he's also a Jew by the most explicit uh, definition. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so the work of God might be displayed in his life. So this is words that we know. And yet there's something resident in each one of us, isn't it? That if we, were, you know, if we went out from this place and someone got hit with a lightning bolt, it's our reflex to think, oh, I wonder what he did. You know, it's, just our, it's just built into us, isn't it? That doctrine of retribution. It's easy to say intellectually when you bring it to the conscious mind. It's easy to say, oh, it's so foolish. Look at this, John chapter 9. So foolish they thought that. But actually it's resident in our subconscious mind. You really have to make an effort to stamp it out to get rid of it. So that's what I'm saying. It's been a long time since those three children of Abraham have been in the house of God. The three friends are in no position to help Job. Not, are they, not only are they physically and geographically homeless, they are spiritually homeless. They're, they're spiritually bereft of any strength or physique. The three friends have fallen victim to the beast of pride, so they have become Job's condemners, not in any sense his comforter. And that means, what about us, I, I provoke? What about us? What, about, what happens when we encounter spiritual Gentiles, those outside of covenant relationship who are having difficulties in their life? What is our automatic response? Is it to say, well, you know, if you, if you started coming to Bible class, you know, you wouldn't have had that car crash. You know, it's, it's not true, is it? We don't go down that road. We need to actually be present and, and listen to those who are suffering and entice them towards the, the love of God. It was God who went out of his way to save those three friends. We might easily scorn them, but that's what Job's suffering was all about. God's work to save the three friends that otherwise would have been lost, to save lives. Let's consider also, you know, it's, it's just wrong not to consider the condition of Job, and, and notice that the, the tortures that are brought upon him, you know, I have a situation, my, my mind is very compartmentalized, and if, if one area of my life is going very badly, I kind of just close it off and run off into the other life. You know, you work in your career or something else, you know, right? And we, I think we maybe all do that. But Job is hit on every possible level. He can't get away. Physically, he's hit. The night drags on, and I toss till dawn. So he doesn't get to sleep. I don't know what lack of sleep does to you, but it makes me grumpy and depressed. Um, my body is clothed with worms and scabs. My skin is broken and festering. Emotionally, think of the weight of this comment. If only my anguish could be weighed, it would surely outweigh the sand of the seas. Socially, their sons mock me in song. I've become a byword among them. They do not hesitate to spit in my face. He's mocked in the marketplace. Personally, even in his most intimate relationship with his partner, my breath has become offensive to my wife. I am loathsome to my own brothers. And perhaps most importantly of all, if you could say, well, at least, at least, with all that destruction, who could bear it all? He can at least take comfort in the relationship he, he has with his God. No, he finds that he can't. I cry out to you, O God, but you don't even answer. I stand up, but you merely look at me. You turn on me ruthlessly. With the might of your hand, you attack me. Now, whether that's true or false, it's what Job perceives to be true. So he has nowhere to run, not in his physical form. He can't go out and exercise and say, oh, forget it, I'll just go for a long run. Uh, not in his emotional life, not in any friends outside of his family, not in any friends or relationship inside his family, nor even with his God. Everything, absolutely everything has been devastated and taken <coughs> away from him. And yet, it is amongst this condition, and uh, this then is the real power of the man Job, that amongst this condition he can still make these well-known words, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. There is the perseverance of Job, of which James speaks, that despite having nowhere to run, he still held on 
to the fact that his God was good and would restore him. And realize that also contributed to his torture. If he'd have believed God was evil, he'd have less mental torture. It's like, of course God's doing this. God's evil. It's because he believed God was good that his torture was so hard to bear. Because he knew his God was loving, he just wasn't able to experience the loving God. And that contradiction would have brought a torture of its own. Surprisingly. Oh, this is just a, a little anecdote. So some of the work uh, that's been going on in the preaching in South Africa, um, it, it, was a good, uh, it was a good match with this situation. I sat down in this little prayer group. Well, we had a lot of kids to entertain, didn't know what to do. So we had a prayer group. This photograph is taken on the following day, but on the day before we had a circle just exactly the same. And I said, uh, you know, because I hadn't had anything planned, I said, well, we're going to have a little prayer here. Why don't you each give me something to pray for? And so each of these children, they were aged between about... Uh, eight and I want to say about 16, um, pretty much the similar group that came the next day that sat here, about the same number too, and they went around and named one thing that they would like to pray for. A lot of them prayed for a large family, so I'd like a large family. And I thought, well, that's odd because they haven't got anything. They're very poor, and not just because the family's bad, so I don't mean that. I just mean because if you've got nothing, why would you want a whole lot of dependents? But, uh, you know, that's just my uh, cultural ignorance. It turns out it's, it's advantageous to have a large family because it's for physical defense. Now, if someone picks a fight with you, you need six brothers. <laughs> if you don't, yeah, this is the truth of their experience. In fact, you could even be displaced from your house. Right? So we might come along, a big family come along and say, oh, I think we'll have this house now. Bye. So you need a large family just to protect yourself. Okay? So a lot of them prayed for a large family. A lot of them prayed for health, uh, for, those, uh, for loved ones and for those who were blind which was very nice. Some of them, you know, were, were much more honest and said, I'd like lots of money, please. And I thought, oh, okay, <laughs> you're an honest guy. Uh, a lot of them wanted to be the best football player that, in the world because they're, they're all football mad, and that's fine. And it was the last child to speak, and I would have gave, saved his comment till last anyway, but he really was the last child to speak. He was the last child in the loop as we went around who was 10 years old. He had to give us his name, his age, and what he wanted. And he just said, every man should be with his God. I don't, you know, he didn't say any more, so I can't explain to you the context, and I didn't need him to say any more. I thought it was just an amazing thing, and it was exactly what, what Job missed most. Do you notice Job didn't pray for his health to be restored? He never prayed for that. He never prayed to be justified in front of his friends, although he was furious at them, as we will see. He just wanted to be with his God. He felt that every man should simply be able to be with his God, should be able to feel the proximate experience of his maker. And that 10-year-old boy said exactly the same thing. I'm sure he hasn't read the book of Job, but it was uh, something that he understands. This is what Job cries, however. May the day of my birth perish, and the night it was said a boy is born. May those who curse days curse that day, those who are ready to rouse Leviathan. Now what we're going to see is that that turns out to be a very ironic comment, because Leviathan who will be described by God, as you well know, in chapter 41. Leviathan very much is roused. So it's one of those be careful what you wish for mo moments. Job calls for the rousing of Leviathan, and Leviathan is going to come along. We'll just explain exactly what Leviathan is and how he shows up uh, a little bit later on. But I do note that that was something that Job invoked upon himself, perhaps uh, not the wisest. So that's the end of, of this talk, and we'll move into the core of the debate tomorrow, just leave you with a closing comment to pay attention to. Now we have the position to understand the approaching debate. We now understand both the who and the where of the debate. So those massive, that massive chunk of the center of Job that just seems to be this tedious, pedantic argument going round and round and round between four really rather boring speakers, or so it seems, we now know, well, the pride that motivated the three friends has been identified, hopefully, confidently, as the Satan of chapter 1 and chapter 2. Satan has not gone away. And the person with whom the Satan is wrestling is Job, who is the righteous man. So what we're about to see is 28 chapters of exactly how spiritual righteousness counters and fights with and parries uh, the spiritual Satan. And today we have determined that that fight takes place in the wilderness in the wilderness land. So what are we learning? We're learning the book of Job is going to tell us that the righteous man 
has been led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And if you want to know how and why Jesus of Nazareth was able to survive his temptation in the wilderness, I suggest to you and cannot prove it's because Jesus learned what to do and what not to do from the book of Job. Sometimes we take Jesus' life too lightly and say, oh, well, he had the spirit without measure. It's easy for him, isn't it? No, Jesus had to learn obedience. And clearly one of his mechanisms was learning the scriptures, which would have included the scrolls of Job. I believe Jesus took his education for how to survive the temptation in the wilderness from the righteous man versus the Satan in the wilderness that had happened before. And we'll see exactly how that pans out tomorrow. Thank you, Rob. Thank you.